you batter your enemy with the shield like that, uh, and then as he falls backward, you get in under arm with a stabbing spear like that. OK, guys, I'm here in London. I'm here at the Royal Philatelic Society for the Clash of Empires Anglo-Zulu War exhibition. It's going to be an amazing opportunity to meet all of the experts on the Anglo-Zulu War and learn a lot of new stuff. I'm going to be posting videos every day. Let's get stuck in. One aspect of the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879 that's always fascinated me is shields. They were a big part of Zulu tactical doctrine, but also had deeper meanings both on and off the battlefield. Ian Knight, co-curator of the event and expert all things Anglo-Zulu War, explains more. Well, Zulu shields were always a hugely important part of actually Zulu material culture uh, and obviously very much of, of military life. In my opinion, it's probably even more than the spear. It's the single most iconic representation of the old Zulu military system because kind of so much hangs in the shields and what it represented uh, in terms of um, service and loyalty and protection and experience. Uh, and yeah, um, this is very much the old Zulu army represented in a physical artifact. We've got 12 original 1879 vintage uh, shields dating to the time of the Anglo-Zulu War. Uh, and then we've got one more modern one, which we've added in just to show that the story of shields isn't over, that it still has a, a modern significance and still uh, is relevant to Zulu culture today. And the shields were taken from the hides of cattle. Now, every Zulu man in his day would have had one or two personal shields uh, in his hut. So when he goes out on a long journey or if there's some problem, he thinks maybe they're going to be attacked, he would have shields for his own personal protection. Uh, they're generally called amahau, although there are different names. There are smaller ones for dancing or courting, which have different names. Uh, but the big regimental war shields, which are probably the most iconic feature of the old Zulu kingdom, uh, they've got a different name. Generally, they're known as isihlangu, uh, which is a, a Zulu word that means brush aside. Uh, you kind of see why when you look at them. And the big regimental war shields were in a different league, really. They weren't personal property. They were the property of the Zulu king. Uh, and the king would keep them in royal homesteads. So when a man went up to join his ibuto, his regiment, to fight on behalf of the king, uh, then he'd be using one of the king's shields. Uh, and the concept of the king's shield is quite an important part of the whole sort of process. Uh, the implication of, of mutual protection, you look after the king, uh, when you fight for him with his shield, he looks after you, he shields you from the enemy. Uh, and then physically, these things were, were then the manifestation of that. Yeah, so you've got one in your hand there. What do we know about this one? Yeah, this is a genuine one brought back from the 1879 Anglo-Zulu War. Um, it's a regimental shield. Uh, it's always difficult. The colour on the front of the hide um, represents the regiment. Uh, so what would happen is that the Zulu kings would match herds of cattle according to the colour of the hide. Uh, and then when a new regiment is formed, some of those animals would be slaughtered and the hides would be used. So all of the men in that regiment then carry shields of that pattern. Now it's actually, there's a lot more subtlety to it. The Zulu vocabulary on the, the subject of patterns of a cow's hide is immense. Um, and they matched up this particular so like type. Zulu, uh, like uh, Eskimos with snow or something yeah, yeah, like that? Yeah, absolutely. No, it is. There's a, um, I, I don't really want to say a number because I'm not sure I'm right, but it's something like 145 different words for the pattern on a cow's hide. Uh, and so they would quite carefully match it. This is a, a pretty standard example. Probably this is from the colour, my guess would be the Ukandampenvu regiment, uh, which was a regiment of, of men in their late 20s, early 30s, in 1879, played a very prominent part in the Anglo-Zulu War, uh, were present in the Zulu centre at the Battle of Isandlwana, and then very prominent at the battles of Kambula and, uh, uh, and Ulundi. Interestingly, and I've spent a lot of time trying to work out the colours of the various different regiments, um, when you were a young warrior, because of course the Zulu regiments were formed of men of a common age, so they all start out about 1819, and then they, they kind of get older and every few years they're issued with different shields. So you start out with a predominantly dark one, then like this one you start to get white on it and you end up with a predominantly white one at, at oh, the end Oh, so it. is this reflective of hair colour? Uh, there, there's an association between this and hair colour, yeah. Um, and the kind of grey beards end up with the white shields. Right. 
but also partly because of the hair color thing, white has associations of maturity and, uh, and experience. So from a commander's point of view, um, if he looks in the distance, who are those guys? Oh, you know, they've all got black shields, not much experience, but they're quick and they're keen. They've all got white shields. These guys have been through this before. You've got that immediate sort of judgment of, uh, of who's who and where they fit into the, into the scheme of things. This is also interesting because, and I'm not suggesting it is his shield, but King Shaga famously had a white shield with a single black spot in the middle. Uh, so this is similar to the type that, uh, that he carried. Uh, and it's just kind of interesting to get an idea of, uh, of what that great man um, used to, to have when, uh, when he was a warrior. Was this a useful piece of kit? Oh, absolutely it was, yeah. Uh, I mean, in terms of, of wars against African enemies, um, this is kind of the you know, height of the technology. It's taken from a single piece of hide, but it's been, uh, it's not really been tanned, but they kind of dry it and prepare it beforehand. Uh, and it, it would certainly catch a thrown spear. A thrown spear wouldn't go all the way through this. Uh, and if you're fighting, um, if you're fighting at close quarters with it, uh, it would be very difficult to stab through this. The most that your opponent could probably hope is that his, his spear would penetrate it, but then the chances are he's stuck because he's now got his spear stuck in your shield and um, you know, you're going to be able to get that out of his hand and, and finish him off. In fighting in, uh, in traditional warfare against African enemies, uh, it was used in a distinct technique. There was a way of using this thing and you would rush down on your enemy. The whole Zulu tactical system was designed to um, bring as many men to close combat as quickly as possible. Uh, if your enemy is throwing spears, then you shelter behind it, so you're not much of a target. You could probably brush aside a thrown spear with a bit of luck, uh, and then you rush down. And the idea was that when you get up close, you batter your enemy with the shield like that, uh, and then as he's falls backward, you get in under arm with a stabbing spear like that. So there was a particular kind of technique. Now, of course, you're using the same techniques when you're fighting the British. Um, the problem there is, no, you're right, it's not going to stop a bullet. Uh, certainly by the 1870s, British firearms, uh, the velocity was just too great. It's going to go straight through this. So I guess you have to hope that, that it serves um, I suppose it serves some protection value in that when you're crouched behind it, the guy can't see his target quite so clearly. Uh, but then, yeah, you've got to try and rush down and attack him with it. Generally, the tactical contest in 1879 is between the British trying to hold the Zulus at arm's distance so they can shoot them, in which case the Zulus haven't got much to, to respond to that, uh, and the Zulus trying to get close up where they can use these weapons. When the Zulus get close up, if you look at these battles, they usually win. If the British stop them getting close up, they usually win. Um, when you have a hand-to-hand -hand fight, this is quite useful against a guy armed with a rifle and bayonet. Uh, he's going to have a longer reach. The Martini with a bayonet on the end has got about a six-foot reach, which is obviously longer than this here. Um, but you can try and catch his bayonet in your shield, pull it to one side, and then you might get in underneath. Um, his guard there and stab him with that. You've made me a bit nervous there. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. <laughs> it, it's got a kind of bite to this thing, even now <laughs> yeah. when you're just showing Still it Still quite off. terrifying. It is quite frightening. You don't want to be on the spiky it? end, yeah. for yeah, no, sure. It means, these mean business, definitely. <laughs> and, but the other thing is quite a lot of Zulu accounts say, oh, well, uh, a guy would lunge at us and we blocked it with the shield and then his bayonet would get stuck in the shield. And of course, then you've just got a second or two when you can maybe twist it aside and, as I say, get, get stuck in. Or even, because normally if it gets hand-to-hand, -hand, the Zulus have got a numerical advantage. You, you get in fighting and, well, okay, you might be struggling to find an opening with each other as you're fighting face-to-face. -face. But, hey, the Zulu's got two or three mates on either side and that guy is then in trouble because he can't, with a rifle and a bayonet, he can't protect himself all round. So it was quite a practical, useful piece of kit, even in the age of modern industrial weapons, as long as you could get close. This one, I think, which is white with fairly large sort of black spots mottling on it. My current reading is that that's probably the Umbonambi Ibuto, who were actually the first to penetrate the British lines at the Battle of Isan Luana. It's one reason why we've used it in this case, which is our case of uh, Isan Luana, 
artifacts relating to the, the obviously the so would, would they have been the unit sort of facing sort of Pope's company out there uh, on the firing yeah, they were. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, they were kind of on the left of the Zulu chest, so they weren't as far out as the Zulu left horn. Uh, but as the British fall back, they kind of get in between Durnford and Pope's mm, men. By the Rocky Ridge sort by of around there. By the Rocky there. Ridge, yeah. And what's the significance of the stitching down the middle? Is there any significance or is it just purely practical to hold the, it, uh, the stick it, in place? It's largely practical to hold the stick in place. So this goes through and folds through up and down on either side. Um, there it is on the back. Uh, if I move that out of the way, you can see it goes through. These are the bits where it folds over and up the other side and back again. So it keeps the, the stick there so that the, um, the weight of the shield is evenly distributed along the, the length of the stick. Uh, but it does become a decorative feature. Uh, you'll notice, and this is quite a good example, um, you try and do it with contrasting colours. So even where we've got black patches and white patches, uh, you can see they've got the black here, but it turns to white as it goes down into the black there. That's really just a decorative thing for the overall look of the shield, but it's quite common. Shields still have a relevance in modern Zulu culture today. Uh, and this one was actually presented to me by His Late Majesty King Goodwill um, at the 2019 um, commemoration of the Battle of Isandlwana. Wow. Uh, and there was a reenactment there which I was involved with and the King presented me with that. So there's that kind of, you know, I don't know whether I have to go and fight on behalf of the King now, but there's still <laughs> that sense of, of presenting it as a token of, uh, of a, uh, an association there, which harkens back to the way that the big war shields were used in, in days of yore. So it's not entirely gone from Zulu culture yet. And of course, a, a lot of guys in rural um, KwaZulu today still have their shields for ceremonial occasions and dancing and stick fights and all that kind of thing. So it, it remains, as I say, a very powerful and iconic piece of Zulu culture. Well, I think you need to be ready for your call-up. I think uh, King Mr. Zulu might, uh, might be calling you any day. It, it is a little concerning that I might suddenly have to <laughs> pick up that spear over there and go, and, yes, um, yeah, well, you know, I've, I have accepted the symbolism of the shield, so I guess if, if he does, I've got to go. <laughs>